Recording now. Hello, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to my YouTube video channel again this afternoon. I have a privilege to uh, and an honor to introduce Dr. Uh, Wenny Harrison, the uh, Vice President of uh, USA, US uh, Dentron, Dentron Dental Implant Company, uh, one of a very unique dental uh, implant technology that I have uh, seen and I would like to have him on our show to really help me out to and help those of you watching my channel and follow my channel and see that what we can bring to the dentistry, the next level of uh, implant dentistry, where when you use it, you will see uh, the confidence that you have for yourself and for your patient. So uh, uh, Dr. Harrison, welcome to the uh, uh, podcast today. Thank you. It's very happy to be here. <clears throat> Dr. Harrison, would you share with the audience a little bit uh, uh, your journey in dentistry? How did you end up? Uh, how did you uh, end it to become a dentist? And how did you? How long you've been practicing in dentistry? And you know your career change, pathway, and so on. Yeah. So I um, I have a master's degree in education, and I was a uh, professional musician for a number of years. I I had a desire to be the principal trumpet of the San Francisco Symphony, and that just never ever worked out. And so I went back to dental school. Uh, had a family history of dentist in my family, and so I finally succumbed and uh, went back to dental school. I uh, graduated in 1983 from uh, Loma Linda University and uh, established a uh, private practice in Chula Vista, California, uh, focused on uh, implant reconstruction and uh, full mouth reconstruction and cosmetic dentistry. Uh, I was very fortunate early on to uh, be introduced to Professor Branamark and uh, sat at his feet for almost 15 years, uh, along with himself and Steve Perrell, uh, and then also was fortunate enough to have uh, been able to take the courses with uh, John Coys and Frank Spear when they were still together. Um, wow. I uh, left full-time practice uh, in 2000 and uh, started a career in corporate America. That was kind of uh, was not my choice. Uh, I was diagnosed with a neuromuscular disease and uh, didn't have the opportunity to continue practicing. And so I've been in corporate America almost as long as I practiced and uh, have been fortunate enough to uh, lecture for Nobel uh, all over the world. They trusted me while I was practicing and after. And um, about three years ago, Dr. Oli Jensen came to me and asked me if I'd be willing to come out of retirement and help him uh, launch Ditron Dental USA. And that's where I find myself now. Beautiful. Real quick question. Are you still playing some music instrument? Yeah, I was a uh, professional trumpet player and uh, and I did great desires. I studied with the principal of the San Francisco Symphony and I had great desires to uh, be part of that orchestra and it just never worked out. So dental school was a uh, second choice. I just want to let you know that the year that you graduated from master degree in music, that's the year when I were born. So ah. you... So we have a big gap, but that's the reason why I brought you in because I love to uh, have somebody with the experience like you with a number of years in dentistry and, and, and life to share and uh, shine the light to those dentists, young dentists and enthusiastic dentists who just come out from dental school and try to pick out like what are the choice that they have in dentistry. So many implant dent company out there and uh, it gets to the point where we're going to go like, all right, so Give me a choice. I, I have so much choice. I need to know more of one company. How is it compatible to the other? But uh, I found Dentron is uh, the, uh, the rising star for dentistry, and uh, I'm sure you have a lot to share. So please, um, you know, uh, uh, let us know like what do you find? How when you, when you start three years ago the conversation? How did you really end up like working uh, with Dentron and feel comfortable and willing to share with us? Yeah, so I, I think the one thing that I kind of left out of the story was that when I got out of dental school, 
uh, being an older dentist, I embrace technology. And, and if I had any admonitions, uh, I have a son who's a senior dental student and, and uh, I, I would tell him the same thing that technology is really the difference maker, I think, in dentistry today. And there's so many technologies out there that we can embrace. Um, being a Nobel person and, and being uh, trained by Branamark himself, I never thought that I would ever leave that uh, particular uh, implant company. However, um, as I became associated with Ditron Dental and did the research, uh, I discovered that the uh, precision and quality of their manufacturing uh, across all the different verticals, and I'll talk a little bit more about that company in a bit, uh, that really kind of swayed me to dig a little bit deeper. And, uh, you know, in implant dentistry, uh, at least in my time when I was practicing full time, the Kelly's heel and implant dentistry is the implant abutment abutment, uh, implant uh, uh, abutment connection. And one of the things that we are always challenged with is screw loosening, screw breakage, a variety of other things. And so as I was introduced to the Ditron system, uh, what I discovered was that screws don't come loose, screws don't break, and that the quality and precision of that uh, particular implant abutment connection was what really attracted Dr. Jensen and then uh, subsequently uh, attracted me as well. Right, absolutely. Now, um, you you traveled to Israel before, or uh, no, uh, no, no. I uh, that's on my uh, that's on my wish list. I have not been, but uh, you know, having gone through uh, the the pandemic here in the last two and a half or three years, about the same time as we launched uh, Ditron here in the U.S. We do everything, obviously, as you and I are today with uh, with Zoom and and uh, virtual meetings. And so uh, I work very, very closely with their engineers and people in Israel uh, as we brought the system here to the U.S. and adapting their system to our U.S. Uh, customs and techniques. And uh, so that's been very rewarding. Okay, absolutely. Uh, so before we uh, go into deeper the, uh, the the design and the you know the technical part, uh, from just uh, just a summary, uh, how would you compare the, what the other kind of dent, the implant dentistry that we have there with Dentron? Like what uh, what what are the unique feature of Dentron? Before we so you show us some slides. Sure. Like that. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, we're in a third generation, fourth generation of dental implants. And I think that one of the things that you'll discover as we share some slides together is that the uh, person who designed our kind of flagship product, the ultimate dental implant, uh, it was a Italian prosthodontist who uh, was very much a student of the literature. And so he had looked at all the things that had been previously tried to mitigate peri-implant disease, and he incorporated them into his design. Uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, that design coupled with his partnering with the manufacturer in Israel, Ditron Precision, uh, you know, really has has made a difference. And so really three things that that I'll focus on as 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 I share some slides. Number one is the design of the implant itself is designed to preserve marginal bone from the get go. So rather than have a millimeter and a half of bone loss, uh, we actually have no bone loss at, at stage two delivery or or when we load the implant. The second thing is the implant about my connection. I've mentioned that many times, but we have less than a half a micron gap, and that's because of the uh, precision of manufacturing, which I'll talk more about in detail. And then the third thing, uh, which I think is is equally important, is the is the simplicity of the system, the versatility of the system. Uh, with uh, Nobel, when I was restoring their implant, placing and doing their implants, obviously uh, they had narrow, regular, or wide platform, and you were always kind of Hail Mary full of grace. I hope I have the right parts, or 
do I have the right parts uh, on the shelf? And whereas with uh, Ditron, uh, it's a single implant Abutma connection, so it's much less complicated parts and pieces. And I'll share that uh, very briefly as we kind of go through some slides together. Okay, please do so. Let, uh, let, let's uh, jump right in and show us, uh, you know, the technology that uh, Dentron have been uh, working real hard and uh, give the the dentist uh, the easy uh, and the confidence that they need for surgery. I would sure. love to see. All right, I'm happy to do so. Let me just uh, share my screen here and uh, and we should be good to go. Uh, we'll get rid of that and. So, you know, when we were talking over the weekend, um, you know, I coined the term the silent intruder. And and one of the things that and kind of have this alarm system here talking about, uh, you know, is this something we need to be concerned about? And the reason that I coined that term was because unlike periodontal disease, where we get some sort of a uh, a warning signal, if you will, uh, peri-implant disease is, is the silent intruder. We oftentimes don't see this until a patient presents with something as radical as you see on the screen here, where uh, our only choice is to try a bone grafting procedure or maybe even remove the implant and start over from scratch. And so one of the things that Dr. Jensen wanted to do with this system was to be able to mitigate that uh, and and be able to uh, bring it forward. And obviously, as we know, in dentistry, with implant dentistry, we don't have a periodontal ligament, uh, which means then we don't have proprioception, which then means that uh, we don't have any temperature sensitivity. So there's really no warning mechanism for patients uh, with implants as to something is is going wrong. Uh, Stuart Fromm, who is a uh, well-known periodontist in New York, uh, suggested in an article in 2012 that the prevalence of peri-implant disease was 28 to 56 percent of patients and 12 to 40 percent of all implants. And then Danny Boozer, back in 1992, uh, talked about probably the theme of what I'm going to talk about today, which is the word vascularity. In dentistry, we learned that form follows function, and, and it's quite interesting that Dr. Boozer said that the peri-implant supracrestal connective tissue is absent of rich vascularity, suggesting that the peri-implant soft tissue does not have a defense against exogenous irritation. Well, that's something that's really important because when we look at Renvert's book on uh, peri-implantitis, we'll notice that the arrows for peri-implantitis all point to the implant abutment connection. They don't point to the implant itself. And so all of this bone loss that we're experiencing is centered around the implant abutment connection itself. It doesn't have anything to do with the osteointegration of the implant. In fact, I tell people all the time that we assume osteointegration. What we don't know is what is the variability of that implant abutment connection. And so in my path uh, in implant dentistry, I, I can honestly say I've probably restored each and every one of these different implant abutment connections. And What's interesting is each company comes along and says, well, mine's the best, uh, you know, try this. It's going to mitigate screw loosening. It'll mitigate micro leakage under mechanical load, et cetera, et cetera. And yet what we know for a fact is that uh, that, that has uh, not really happened. And so when we look at some of the solutions that have been tried over the years to prevent or to mitigate this uh, this Achilles heel, if you will, is, you know, we start with Dr. Lazara. So Richard and I are very close friends and obviously was the father of uh, the 3i implant, which is now Zimmer Biomet. And yet in his studies, he introduced this concept of platform switching where we'd have a smaller diameter uh, abutment against a larger diameter implant. The idea being that we could then have more bone in concert at that uh, otherwise uh, imperfect junction. 
and that we could end up with uh, with maybe less uh, particular bone loss. I apologize. And so then when we fast forward and we look at Dennis Tarnow, Tarnow in 2000, uh, you know, said that biologic width around implants has been well documented. We're going to have vertical bone loss of millimeter to half to two millimeters. And, and so that was something that, you know, that Danza wanted to mitigate in his design. And then uh, Tarnow went on and said that if we have three millimeters distance or greater between implants, that we can actually reduce that uh, incidence of bone loss by uh, uh, 0.45 millimeters, whereas if we have less distance, uh, then we're going to have a, a more significant uh, uh, defect. And, and then his classic article from 2003 then really talks about conventional dentistry of the, uh, the distance from the crest of the bone to the contact point on adjacent teeth. And he, and he stated that if it was five millimeters or less, the papillae could completely fill the space almost 100% of the time. And so what we know then is that if we follow the admin of form follows function, then we would say, well, if I don't have bone, if I've lost a millimeter and a half or two millimeters of bone, then I don't have vascularity. And if I don't have vascularity, I don't have an interdental papillae. And so everything is kind of out the door. And so Dr. Jensen, in his time in Israel, uh, in, in his lectures over there, uh, discovered a company called Ditron Precision. Now, Ditron Precision is quite an interesting company because in addition to having a uh, medical device vertical, uh, they also manufacture uh, steering mechanism parts for about 70% of the cars that are on the road today. So Mercedes, uh, Tesla, GMC, BMW, uh, and on and on and on, uh, as well as Formula One race cars. And all of these companies, both SpaceX, for example, with, uh, with uh, Elon Musk, some of the parts and pieces in his space rocket are manufactured by Ditron Precision. And, and so that Ditron Precision is held to a manufacturing tolerance of less than three microns. Uh, I've had a lot of arguments with different engineers and whatever over, is that even possible to manufacture at that level? And when you find someone that really understands manufacturing and, and different tolerances, and of course, I'll say, yes, of, of course, you can do that. And so then in an article in 2019 by Michelle Coffrin in the Journal of Clinical Biomechanics, she went on to suggest that the literature has indicated a range of 1 to 120 microns representing a wide variability that influences the fit of prosthetic components and the mechanical stability of the entire system. And so the whole premise behind Ditron Dental was to mitigate this and to, to do so, uh, Professor Danza in early 2000 started to do research on something that he called platform switching and bone platform switching. Well, platform switching, we already know what that entails in implant dentistry, but bone platform switching is, is something that's uh, uh, quite different from that. And so what Danza was really trying to mitigate was that initial millimeter and a half or two millimeters of bone loss, which as you can see it, it, in the aesthetic zone, uh, again, if we don't have bone, we don't have vascularity, don't have vascularity, we don't have papillae, and now we have black triangle disease. And so that was one of the things that he wanted to be able to mitigate in, in his design. And so what he put forward uh, was this design was something he called the ultimate reverse neck. And the idea behind this implant would be that the coronal portion of the implant is actually going to be smaller than the stated diameter of the implant. And so you would underprepare the osteotomy. And, uh, and then when the implant goes in uh, with very slight compression of the crestal bone, and then everything would spring back. 
And because of the design of the implant coupled with the implant abutment connection, uh, you would not have bone loss and therefore we wouldn't experience that millimeter and a half or two millimeters of bone loss. One of the other kind of unique things that came out of that was that if you read his article that I put up from 2009, he quoted Lazara, he quoted Tarnow, he quoted several others of things that they had tried. But what's interesting is if we took two 5.0 ultimate implants and we somehow uh, magically were able to place them side by side in the mouth, the distance that we would have between the two uh, reverse concavities is 2.8 millimeters, which is almost exactly what Tarnow said that we needed to have to be able to facilitate uh, you know, all the things necessary for success. And so Danza then designed this implant with kind of four features. The first feature was the reverse concave neck, which was designed to preserve marginal bone from the get-go. The second feature were the double stressless sharp threads. And the importance of the double stressless sharp threads, as you can see on the image on the left, is the stability that the implant uh, provides uh, regardless of the bone type. The third feature was the helical apical coronal slot. It's this blue slot that you see on the implant. And the importance of that was as the implant was being placed, everything was designed to wash up the side of the implant and create a scaffolding, if you will, for early bone formation. And then last but not least was a uh, cutting apex and it's a rounded cutting apex so it doesn't do any damage uh, to the soft tissue. And so if we look at each of those features, uh, you know, independently, the double stressless sharp threads, they generate a very uh, gentle progressive uh, uh, bone compaction that actually enhance stability. And Giorgios Romanos at Stony Brook uh, presented a paper at the uh, Academy of Austrian Integration this uh, past February, where he showed that he, placing both short, fat, uh, and uh, uh, long and skinny uh, Ditron uh, ultimate implants that the average insertion torque was somewhere between 55 and 60 uh, Newton centimeters adequate enough to uh, allow you to immediately load the implant. And then when we look at the helical apical coronal slot, all of this blue that you see around this ultimate implant is actually new bone formation at one month's time. And so we get that early uh, uh, osseointegration, that early uh, accelerated osseointegration, which then gives us confidence to be able to uh, uh, load an implant uh, uh, early on. And so this is uh, a case that we did uh, with uh, external resorption on uh, tooth number eight and nine, and uh, the teeth were extracted and immediately placed were two ultimate uh, 4.2 by 16 millimeter implants. And what was interesting by this design is the insertion torque that we got of 69 Newton centimeters, giving us the confidence to be able to go and load these implants almost uh, immediately uh, and, and you can see the beautiful soft tissue and everything else. And so when we look at some of Danza's eight-year follow-up, sadly, he passed in 2016, uh, you'll notice the beautiful soft tissue. One of the other things that you'll notice is that when you remove an abutment, uh, you don't get that stinky, uh, you don't get that stinky smell uh, that you get sometimes with other uh, implant systems when you uh, when you remove an abutment. And then, of course, you can see the beautiful bone that's still present eight years out. So the implant is placed slightly uh, subcrestal, and we still have all the beautiful bone, which then means uh, we're going to have uh, the interdental papillae. And so what Danza showed was that if we took a traditional 4.2 millimeter diameter tapered implant, and we were to place that in a six millimeter bone sample, say a maxillary lateral incisor, we would probably never do that because we wouldn't have enough uh, bone circumferentially left to 
uh, provide the support that we've always been told that we need of two millimeters or more. However, if we put in an ultimate 4.2 that has a 375 coronal, then all of a sudden you can see kind of that V between the extension of what a tapered implant would be. Uh, you can see that all of that area there is going to be new bone that has been preserved as opposed to uh, as opposed to drilled away. And so Danza went on uh, being the researcher that he was, and he quantified this, and uh, he determined that the bone savings uh, coronally was equal to 5.57 cubic millimeters or a millimeter ring of bone that Dr. Jensen and I kind of jokingly call the Lord of the ring of bone. So that's kind of the, the first principle, if you will, Dr., uh, that that introduces the design of the implant and, and the benefits of that. And, and then the next thing that we, I apologize, the next thing that we did then was said, well, what should the connection be? And Danza came to Ditron Precision because of their reputation of, of being extremely uh, precise and quality oriented in their manufacturing. And one of the things that they looked on early on was should there be a conical implant abutment connection? And so they took uh, 10 conical implant abutment connection systems, they connected them, they torqued them, and they put that in a bacteria media. And what they discovered was that six of the 10 uh, had immediate micro leakage at the implant abutment connection. And so with that, they then sectioned the implants and they discovered that either the abutment was out of round or the implant was out of round. And so therefore, no matter how perfect uh, everything was, there was this pathway uh, for micro leakage. And so with that, the company decided to do uh, an internal hex, uh, 2.45 millimeter internal hex, but the important part is not the precision of the hex. The important part is the precision and the quality of the two mating surfaces. So when we tested these in a study, uh, which I'll share with you in a moment, we discovered that we had less than a half a micron gap. It's almost like a one piece implant. And so with confidence, we can place the implant uh, at the crest or subcrestal uh, we can connect the abutment, we can torque the screw, and we can almost with confidence know as the pictures that I shared that we're not going to have bone loss and, and that we're going to have uh, a good success long term. And so we proved that in a study in Jerusalem at Hadassah University, where we did just that. We connected implants and abutments with bacteria in the well and no bacteria in the well. And then we went and we looked at uh, at the uh, did bacteria get in or out, and the fact is uh, that it did not. Um, the last couple things I'll share with you about the system, and then I'll answer any questions that you may have, is that uh, the versatility of the system is such that it's a single uh, 2.4 uh, implant internal hex connection and that's shared across all implants, diameters, and lengths. So we don't have to worry, as we discussed earlier, about narrow, regular, wide platform. Uh, and, and then it has a, a full complement of, uh, of digital workflow products, of multi-unit products, and we even have our own proprietary uh, uh, locator-like abutment that we call the Liberator, uh, that was uh, redesigned with some features that deflect direct axial loads on overdentures, which makes it really nice. And then the last couple things I'll share is just the the instrumentation uh, is also very simplified in that we have a single implant insertion driver that can both place the implant as well as the cover and healing screws, and then single abutment uh, hex driver. Uh, for placing all abutments. So that just kind of demystifies and uncomplicates uh, a doctor's life. And then uh, the very last thing is just the showing you kind of putting it all together with the precision and the quality and the research of the company. 
Uh, this was a study that was done by uh, Shahar, and uh, he was extracting uh, molar teeth on white mice and wanted to know, um, you know, was there any peri-implant disease, any marginal bone loss? And so we asked the company to design this half a millimeter by one and a half millimeter implant, and uh, and they did so, and uh, the rest is is kind of history. So with that, I'm going to unshare my screen unless you have questions, and uh, be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Beautiful, uh, Dr. Harrison. Thank you so much for taking your time and sharing the. Uh... The, the best technology out there that I can see. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to let the audience uh, just to remind them about the uh, what uh, Dr. Harrison was talking about, the simplify of the implant driver. You, even though you have different side of the implant, right? But you only use one side, one driver. Yes, so yes. That's, that's important because we know that other implant technology out there you have to pick the right side for the implant and the right side for the implant driver. And uh, let's say if you drop on the floor, then that's it. You running around and uh, chicken, kick chicken to run around and worry about. Okay, I, I I mess it up. But this is the simplified technology, as you can see. And you also mentioned that the implant abutment driver also the same thing, Doctor Harrison. Yes. You yes. can you, you can use both uh, for for everything or just. No, yeah. So the so the implant insertion driver has the hex for delivering the implant, and then it has a conical hex for delivering uh, a healing abutment recovery screw. But you would not use that for a final abutment because that's a hex screw, mm -hmm. and you need a true hex driver. But we only have a single driver for that as well. We don't have to have stars and shapes and all kinds of other things, which just makes life uh, much easier for the uh, restoring doctors. Yeah, so <clears throat> the reason I point this out is because uh, a lot of dentists out there, they go like, well, it's just another implant system. But as you can see, this implant system that I discover, uh, discover myself, it is actually a unique uh, uh, system because you don't deal with multiple uh, uh, side for the uh, implant driver. That's something that is already simplified for us at a surgeon. And, and when we're at a surgeon, you already have enough stress. And now you, when you sit down, you don't have to worry about, okay, I'm gonna gotta pick this color, right? That's color, right? Is it true, Dr. Harrison? That's something that as a surgeon, we stress out on that, right? We pick the different side and look around and drop it. Oh, it's, okay, can I change it? Let, let's get another one. It's, 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 it's uh, always stressed, but this is something that they're trying to reduce the stress. And uh, so it's beautiful. The other thing you mentioned is the, uh, I want to um, repeat again, is the gap between the abutment, the final abutment, and the implant itself is less than 0.5 uh, nanometer. Is that uh, what it micron, is? Yeah, Mi yeah, micron, micron, yeah. Micron. So it is. Uh, it's smaller than this bacteria side, the smallest yes. bacteria side. Yes. So that what it means is that you you there's less chance of uh, micro leakage and and bacteria uh, colonization and then the smell of the abutment inside the, uh, the when you retreat the crown and uh, hopefully this one we don't have to retreat the crown of there is it. Yes. <clears throat> Can you hear me well or no? Yeah, I hear you perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yes. So yeah, so uh, it's 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 wonderful to to um, to see. You know, finally we have something that news. I want to ask you about the surgical procedure. When you mentioned, let's say, uh, first of all, can you tell us how many side of this implant? Like, uh, what what are the side? Yeah, so the uh, the ultimate implant, uh, let me just share my screen again here real quickly. And, um, and so the ultimate implant, um, the ultimate implant comes in uh, four sizes, 375, 4.2, 5.0, and 6.0. And each one has a different coronal dimension. So you can see that the 375, has a 375 coronal and uh, the 4.2 has a 375 coronal. You'll also notice they both have the same apical dimension. 
And so what that does is even uh, further uh, uh, completes kind of the versatility of the system where uh, you can almost uh, not ever have to use the 375 and you can go straight to the 4.2 because all the dimensions are the same with the exception of the uh, portion of the implant just below the uh, the micro groove. So uh, that's one of the really nice things. I did not share, uh, doctor, we do have a taper system we call the molecular precision implant, and it comes at a smaller diameter, 3.3 and 3.5 up to a six millimeter diameter. Uh, the ultimate implant was not conducive to having a smaller diameter and still have the reverse concavity and protect the integrity, the structural integrity of the implant. So that's why uh, we do have a, a standard tapered implant. Uh, this particular implant has a couple interesting features. Uh, it has a spherical helix, very similar to the helical uh, coronal slot and the spherical helix is designed the same thing. So as the implant is placed, everything spirals up and washes up the side of the implant. And then the deeper grooves that create that helix uh, also increase the surface area of the implant. So a six millimeter uh, ditron uh, molecular uh, precision implant is probably equal to seven or seven and a half millimeters in terms of surface area. Uh, and so that's just another advantage where you can place a six millimeter implant and yet have the surface area of a much long, a larger implant without uh, compromising the buccolingual uh, dimension of the bone. So hope that answers your question. Which, which, which implant design is the, um, more uh, later at the uh, uh, later design? The, uh, the yeah, ultimate? so it would be it would be Danz's design of the ultimate implant. This is this is the design that that uh, that uh, Danza brought to the table, and we probably sell seventy percent of the implants we sell are of the ultimate variety and 30% are, are the molecular precision variety. And most of the MPI or molecular precision implants that we sell are the smaller diameter uh, for very tight, uh, small diameter spaces. Would you, would you go over the surgical uh, protocol on this, uh, on this uh, um, Utimate uh, implant? Yeah, itself? so let me, um, let me just open another screen really quickly if I can. Uh, and I'll bring up a, another picture. Ah, that's not what I want. Uh, I apologize. Uh, so we'll close all those tabs and here we go. So when we look at the uh, drilling protocol, uh, of the uh, particular system, um, and I'll just expand this here so you can see everything on the screen. Uh, so when we look, these are the different drills that we have. So we pretty much abandoned the stainless steel drills and uh, we uh, focus uh, on carbon coated drills. And so you can see the nice advantage of the carbon coated drills is that uh, you see the silver markings on the drills uh, they give us a very clear indication of depth. Uh, the band is 8 and 10, and then the next band is 13 and 16. But we also make drill stopper drills, which uh, is very nice for doctors that, uh, that don't want to have to be worried about where the lines on the drills are, whatever the case may be. But to answer your question, this is kind of the drilling sequence that we follow. So on the left-hand side would be type three and four bone, and on the right-hand side would be type one and two bone. So depending on the diameter of the implant we're placing, after we've used that initial uh, two millimeter twist drill, uh, you know, I tell doctors all the time, your hands tell you uh, you know, what kind of quality bone you have. And, and so if you're going in with a twist drill and you get through the crestal bone and it all of a sudden just goes to the bottom, you know, you probably don't have very, very good quality bone. And so what we do with each implant is based on the bone type, on type three and four bone, we often under prepare by two drill sizes 
And on type one and two bone, we often underprepare by one drill size. And in fact, what we may do is actually, uh, you know, stage the drilling. So for example, uh, we may take a 2.8 drill and drill to full depth. And then we take the 3.2 drill and we only drill in halfway, uh, depending on that bone type. And, and as each uh, implant diameter goes up in diameter, then very similar. So here with a 4.2 implant, uh, you can see that we may drill to full depth with a 3.8, but if the bone quality is compromised, we may only drill to halfway in with a 3.8. And then when the implant is placed, we would only expect maybe uh, one and a half or, or two millimeters of the implant may be uh, exposed above the uh, above the uh, crustal bone, and then we can ratchet that implant in very carefully the remainder of the way uh, and achieve very high uh, initial uh, torque and stability, which is something that's really important. So basically, one of the things, of the things I didn't mention, uh, doctor, which I think is really critical, and I probably should have, but I just didn't know what our time was going to be like, is that uh, there was a study done uh, by the dean of the dental school in um, the dean of the dental school at Harvard. And uh, our implant is manufactured out of medical grade 23 Thai alloy. And that's really important because two studies have just been done and published recently. Uh, Thai alloy or grade 23 Thai alloy has a very, uh, a very high corrosion resistance and it also has very low oxygen content, which is good. And Gia Noble did a study at Harvard in 2018, and he was prompted to do the study by the orthopedic literature. And the orthopods were showing a peri-implant-like reaction around hips and knees, and there was no tooth or whatever there. And so as they did more investigation, what they found was that there was a medical particle release uh, that occurred uh, over time with the implant, a degradation of the surface. Romanos repeated that study uh, and published a paper in January of this year. And he looked at several different implant compositions. I won't mention the implant companies, but they're very popular companies. And then he used zirconia as the control. And then Ditron Dental was also one of the uh, implants that was looked at. And some of the very popular uh, implant brands uh, in the industry were shown to have medical particle release at the time of placement, which could be an early precursor, if you precursor, if you will, to uh, peri-implant disease. And so uh, that that's a very important paper. And so one of the things we didn't talk about our system is all of our implants and abutments are made of this medical grade uh, 23 Thai alloy. So that's something else that's that's really important about our system. Wonderful. <clears throat> so going back, you basically the uh, for this particular uh, Udemy implant, let's say if you have a size five uh, uh, millimeter, uh, six millimeter implant, you would uh, your your final drill probably just uh, like a millimeter less than the yeah, so yeah, so depending on the bone type, our final drill could be 4.5 or our final drill could be 5.0. Uh, and, and, and as I say, your hands really kind of tell you that better than, than anything else, than any Hounsfield score you can get from a CBCT or any other type of uh, technology. Uh, and, and the other thing that we know is that the uh, insertion torque that we're getting, that average insertion torque is 55 to 60 Newton centimeters in, in the majority of bone types. And so that's really important uh, for confidence of being able to immediate load. Right. So the typical uh, uh, surgeon, you guys know that, you know, most of us, if we can achieve like 30, 35 Newton centimeter, we, we're confident already. But now we're talking about 60, 69 Newton centimeter. So, uh, what a what a champion that I can see. So, yeah. wow, it's incredible. 
Uh, can you describe a, again a little bit about the, the double stressless sharp thread that you mentioned? Yeah, so, yeah, so the double stressless sharp threads are really, uh, I'll just kind of come back and share the screen again. So the double stressless sharp threads are really, um, uh, let me just find that picture for you. So they are really, um, they are designed to provide that initial stability, uh, but more importantly, to uh, very gently uh, uh, engage the bone. So we're not getting compaction of the bone or compression of the bone that would damage the vas vascularity, quite the opposite. We're getting a, uh, a nice uh, stability of the bone without, pardon me, without that uh, compression that you normally would have. And and the other advantage is that with the cutting apex, the rounded cutting apex, uh, you know, we, we unless you run into cortical bone at the base of the osteotomy, uh, this cutting apex is going to aid uh, as well in, in terms of the fact that we underprepare the osteotomy. But then another factor of the cutting apex, especially the fact that it's rounded, is that we can tent up the uh, the Schneiderian membrane and the sinus uh, upwards of three millimeters. Uh, and so we can take a five millimeter space of bone and put it in an eight millimeter implant with great confidence without, uh, without any risk of tearing the Schneiderian membrane or in any way uh, affecting any other uh, sensitive landmarks in the, in the mouth. Amazing, amazing. And uh, can you also uh, go back to the reverse conical neck and talk a little bit about how it uh, it uh, helped the uh, reduce the bone loss right at the initial state and the yeah so so Dan's idea was that he wanted this uh, he he wanted this reverse concave neck to preserve a, a certain volume of bone. And and up, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So we called this a uh, bone platform switching, with the idea in mind that if this were a tapered 4.2 implant, we would have prepped all that bone away. Whereas with this being a 4.2 implant with a 375 coronal, you can see that we have saved all of that marginal bone. And his idea was that the reverse concave neck. Uh, that the uh, the area A that you see here uh, would preserve a ring of marginal bone, reduce stress on the crestal cortical bone, and present uh, prevent any undesired vascular compression. And then the uh, the platform switching B is the same as we would see with other companies. But you'll notice our platform switch is not as radical as what you might see with other companies, and we don't need to be because of a molecular uh, implant abutment connection, uh, which uh, it, it provides that less than a half a micron gap uh, that we were talking about. And so uh, that connection, in fact, prevents the uh, micro leakage under mechanical load uh, less down to, as you were saying, less than a half a micron or smaller than a a normal uh, bacteria. Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Very, very impressive system. Uh, in terms of the lab, uh, is there any uh, real limitation in terms of using the lab uh, or the, you know, if we do the digital scanning uh, and do we have the uh, uh, what they call it, the scanner body to scan. Yeah. So yes. So the um, let me just get out of this here really fast, and I will open another screen. And um, so so we'll switch back to this. And we have a full uh, digital workflow such that, um, so our CAD cam uh, has a direct to the implant scan body that you can see here. 
uh, is 3.8 millimeters uh, in diameter. We're just getting ready to release a smaller diameter scan body. Uh, we haven't done that yet. And then we also have a scan body for a multi-unit abutment. So uh, if we have multi-unit uh, abutments in the mouth and we want to do a digital scan, then we can. And then if we want to do custom abutments, uh, we have tie blanks uh, that would allow you to be able to mill a custom abutment. And so the upper portion here is the part that would connect into the milling machine holder. And then this bottom portion is our proprietary Moleculoc uh, connection. And so you can machine uh, very nicely uh, custom abutments uh, that have all of our connection features uh, and, and do that with confidence. And we actually, uh, we work with a milling center that doesn't do anything other than mill abutments in Southern California called Imagine USA and uh, including our abutment and a final custom abutment, they charge $99. So different than the $200 range of uh, Atlantis or Vulcan, uh, you can get a custom milled abutment uh, with the Ditron system for as little uh, as $99. And then probably my favorite abutment uh, is the tie base that we sell and so imagine that if you uh, if you put an implant at the crest or slightly subcrestal, uh, either a multi-unit uh, case with a non-engaging abutment or a single case with an engaging abutment, we have a 0.6 millimeter collar uh, tie base. And so it allows you to start the emergence profile almost perfectly uh, next to the uh, next to the bone with the confidence you're not going to have screw loosening micro leakage but more importantly it allows you to create a, an emergence profile that's very similar to what uh, we might expect with a uh, natural tooth can you can you say one more time can you describe about this again i didn't get this one yeah so let me uh let me just switch gears a minute here and uh, i'm gonna i'll open up another slide deck uh, real fast, and we'll end this deck, and we'll go to a different. You're asking me lots of good questions, Doctor. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 try to see if we can. Uh, we can. I can introduce this to the world. So that's what. Why it's yeah, well, important. I appreciate that. Uh, so I am going to go and. Uh, let me see. That's the wrong system. That's not what I want. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, too many screens open. Um, so here we go. So we're going to open this screen and there we go. And uh, so. I'm going to get all the way down here. So when we look at this particular single tooth screw retained uh, restoration, so uh, we're going to put implants in the number 19 and 20 area. And so the uh, implants are placed uh, with healing collars. And you can see we place them at or slightly uh, subcrestal. Uh, this is a uh, 4.2, and this is a, uh, a 5.0 implant. And uh, the uh, healing collars were put on in a single-stage surgery, and we waited about eight weeks to do the uh, to do the final impressions. And uh, those impressions then were done uh, with our scan body. And one of the other things that's unique to our system is that other system scan bodies are either made out of a peak or a plastic material. Uh, our scan bodies all have a metal or our titanium uh, alloy connection. And so number one, they're reusable, which saves cost. Uh, and number two, uh, they're not gonna deform. So you always know when you connect this in the mouth that you're gonna get a very accurate uh, digital scan. 
and then we scan that and take it in, uh, in this case, to the three shape uh, software. We could do the same with ExoCAD. And uh, we're going to align our scan with the, uh, with the software. And then we select this uh, tie base that has a 0.6 millimeter collar. And so the tie base you can see is going to be uh, the, the restorative margin for the implant abutment is going to be very close to the, uh, to the crest of the bone. So in terms of emergence profile, we get a very ideal uh, emergence profile, as, as you can see here. Uh, and whether you want to do cementable or screw retained, uh, you can see that, that we very easily could do either. Uh, in this case, uh, we uh, cement the uh, final crowns to the abutments outside of the mouth, and then we're going to deliver them uh, to the mouth uh, for the uh, for the final placement. And and here you can see the final placement. And we would expect that eight, nine, ten, fifteen years from now, we're going to see this same kind of bone uh, volume without the bone loss that that we had shared earlier. Uh, with other systems. Does that help? Really helpful. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Harrison, uh, was an, uh, if you can uh, un unshare your screen and then what an awesome uh, presentation and I really uh, appreciate your time and effort to share uh, uh, your, you know, this unique system like this, or this implant system in America because uh, uh, what uh, those of us been practicing dentistry 20 years, uh, doing uh, implant dentistry, uh, you know, when I see the Nitron, I, I want to know more. But uh, I, I met you during the uh, o, uh, AO last year. Uh, oh, in, that's in right. The, in, did. Yeah, in San Diego, where, you know, we have the, uh, uh, in the uh, beautiful uh, uh, dinner at the. You uh, were on the, uh, you were on the midway with yes. Joe Yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, what, uh, what a chance that we can come up on the, uh, podcast like this and talk about Dytron, uh, USA and dental technology. It's wonderful to see you again. And I can't wait to, you know, host you another, uh, event like this and hopefully see you in person again soon. Uh, All right, well, so. thank you so much for the opportunity and you have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.